All right. All right, uh, Sam, welcome back uh, to T2. Um, I understand you have a, a how-to tutorial for our, our students. Um, again, gentlemen, those of you that um, uh, were here last week, uh, we have Sam uh, Usi uh, presenting the tutorial uh, from uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. And um, Sam, go ahead, take it away. Cool. Thanks, Mr. Garza. All right, I'm gonna switch over. Um, so for this, um, for this week's last week, we you know was a bit more of a formal uh, presentation. So if it's all right with you guys, this week I want to keep it a little less formal. Um, and so feel free to to ask questions throughout if there's stuff you'd like me to focus on. Uh, this is going to be a, a, a little less structured. Is is my Photoshop coming through right now? Yes, it is. Using Photoshop, okay. So the the way I've the way I've just sort of loosely set this up is that I've got a couple um, slides here of of painting principles I've learned. Uh, over the years that I think are, are just very fundamental that that could be helpful um, in your work and I'm also just as we go I'm gonna just do this little thumbnail painting of a trolley uh, this is a picture of a trolley I took in New Orleans a couple years back um, it's it's pretty straightforward it's got a single uh, you know white source coming in from the upper left you know strong just strong basic shapes um, and in the spirit of just sort of drawing and, and not being afraid to draw and, and maybe even failing uh, I'm just gonna, as we go, I'm just gonna sort of doodle with this thing, and, and you'll so you'll get to see how I work, how I, you know, my process. I do want to remind you guys, I'm not a trained painter or illustrator, uh, so yeah, I, I I didn't go to school for this. I don't really have any formal education. In this this is all just sort of stuff I've picked up over time. So you know, if, if there isn't as much structure to my process, or you know, um, that's that's sort of a part of that, and I'm still learning. I'm still very much in the process of learning. Uh, I've never actually done a, a live demo like this before for people, so um, I'm I'm still sort of learning as I go. So forgive me if you know if, if there's mistakes or if, or if you know I have to kind of backtrack a little bit. I apologize, but hopefully um, I've included in these slides work from uh, artists I really look up to, so that you know hopefully you guys if if my stuff doesn't turn out all right, there there will be plenty of stuff here that uh, that hopefully should give you guys inspiration and that you can learn from as well, uh, some from finished pieces. You know, it, it's kind of hard to do a really nice finished piece in an hour. Um, so, you know, <laughs> we'll just, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, so, and also as, as I'm working, feel free to ask questions, um, you know, as I'm going that way, you know, if there's stuff you guys really want me to focus on or, or questions you're really interested in, um, I can try and answer those and maybe I can even demonstrate it on screen here for you. Uh, so uh, I'd like to kind of structure this as much more of a sort of back and forth work session this time and, and uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, so, you know, so as I mentioned, I've got this uh, image of a, tr of a trolley here, uh, took in, taken in New Orleans. I, I had a couple pictures I was debating using, but this one given, you know, structurally, it's, it's got a nice sort of one point perspective there. You guys I'm pretty sure are all familiar with one point perspective. Um, you've got a single white source of the sunlight coming in from the top left. Um, it's, it's sort of a nice, uh, you know, strong, strong uh, primary colors in, in the image. So it's a fairly, fairly simple, straightforward, straightforward painting, um, you know, and it's also, and I haven't really, so I've done this little sketch down below, just getting the basic shapes out there. Really, that was a really just quick, loose sketch, really wasn't fussing with it too much. Um, just trying to get the basic shapes in there. Um, and as I begin to paint, one of the first things I'm going to start to try and think about is... Uh, called the, the Howard Pyle form principle. Um, Howard Pyle was an American illustrator, uh, was sort of considered the father of American illustration. And he laid down uh, this sort of basic principles in terms of how to think about form when you're painting or drawing form, how to uh, think about uh, light and how it affects objects. And I'm gonna try and share with you that, that principle here. And it, it is a bit complicated, so I, I apologize, but I've made this little graphic here on the right to try and uh, to try and illustrate it, but uh, whenever you make a painting, one of the first things you're going to have to think about is how you separate light and shadow. Um, having your your painting, in order for it to work, absolutely necessary, absolutely has to have a, a a differentiation between its lights and its shadows, and you can't muddy that. If 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 your lights and shadows get muddy, uh, if your structure of that gets muddy, um, then your painting is is isn't going to work. And a lot of times, if your painting isn't working, uh, this is probably why. And so how, what Howard Pyle laid out is, is what specifically uh, to put in the light and what specifically to put in the shadow. So stuff like texture, in Howard Pyle, by Howard Pyle's theory, texture only belongs to the light, 
right? Texture, uh, you don't, uh, don't worry about painting that in the shadow. Um, it's not needed in the shadow. Shadow is where you get your form. It's where you get your solidity. You know, if, if you think about the universe, um, the only reason we can really perceive objects in three dimensions is because we have a light source, right? If, if there was no shadow, we literally wouldn't be able to, 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 to view objects in three-dimensional form. Everything would be overexposed, bleached out. It's, it's shadow, it, it's the absence of light that actually allows us to perceive things in three dimensions. Um, and so shadow is really purely relegated to form. Um, and then, but things like texture, quality of light, local color, um, you know, all that stuff belongs to the light category. Um, and so anything you put in the light category, you want to keep brighter. You want to make, actually make it uh, kind of emphasize that you actually want to design it to be slightly brighter than even it might be in real, you might perceive it to be in real life. And anything um, that's really emphasizing form or, or solidity, you really want to emphasize, um, you know, you really want to put that into shadow, make that slightly darker than maybe it would be in real life. Uh, and so that, and that's sort of how you begin to design your painting. And you're going to find there's a lot of gray area in the half tones, right? You're going to find a lot of that a lot of there's a lot of surfaces whenever you're observing an object that are sort of in between that, um, you know, surfaces that maybe maybe you're, you're kind of going back and forth. Is that in light? Is that in shadow? And it may be a little bit difficult to figure out. And so your half tones is really where a lot of your design is going to get come in. And what Howard Pyle says is that any half tone that um, that you see that's really about communicating texture or qual or color or quality, you put that half tone in the light category. Any half tone that's a, that you perceive as being about form, you put that in the shadow category. So um, that's sort of how you begin to design your half tones in your painting. And um, so this is, you know, so for considering, for example, here, I, I did this little painting of a cue ball on my iPad a couple of years ago. Um, all the texture, all the texture in this, in the cue ball, all the scuffs on it, I tried to keep in the white category, right? But the shadow itself is a fairly unified and almost softened, is a fairly unified, almost softened shape, right? And uh, the local color, the local color uh, of the red cue ball is all going to be right along the band around the, along the middle, right before it meets the shadow. Um, you know, so all the texture, color, quality, all that stuff really belongs to the light. Stuff like the, but you actually perceive the ball as a three-dimensional object because of the shadow. And that's, uh, so that's sort of just a very simple, basic way to, to design your, your paintings. But um, it's, it's fundamental and, and it's critical to what you're doing. Um, so, as, so as I start this, um, one of the first things I'm going to do is just try to separate my lights and darks. And I, I know that sounds pretty, pretty basic, but, um, you know, it, it's really going to be crucial to the structure of your painting. So here, you know, in, in this painting, we've got this whole right side of the trolley here is all in shadow. And I'm actually going to unite it with the shadow that's on the ground here as well. Uh, basically, I'm going to treat that as one, you know, as basically one big shape. And I'm not going to, and you'll see, I'm not, I'm not going to fuss around too much with, with, with sort of details here. I'm, I'm going to work really, just really loose here. I'm just, you know, um, so you see as I go, I apologize. It's going to be sort of rough, but, you know, um, I'm just going to try and keep this as a really sort of sketchy, fun little thumbnail. Um, so really, this is all I'm, I'm right now, I've, I've put down one big shape of a shadow. And you may be immediately thinking, well, there's a lots of different shapes in there. You know, there's the shadow under the train, there's the shadow outside of the train, there's, you know, the train itself, all these different pieces in shadow. When you're first starting out, treat it as one big shape, look for those opportunities where you can unite objects. And a lot of the design in your painting is going to come from actually how much you simplify your image, how much you actually join shapes, how much you combine those shapes. Um, and, and so that's really something, again, um, that's where a lot of your design is going to come from. And uh, it's going to what's all, it's also going to be what gives your painting structure. Because, you know, some of the best paintings, they actually don't show you more information than you perceive in real life. Real life is infinitely complex. You know, each of these pebbles is infinitely complex, you know. So um, what you actually do as a painter is you actually simplify, you actually break down what you're seeing into something um, uh, something a little bit simpler that communicates what you're trying to tell, some sort of story that you're trying to tell. And so um, my darkest darks are going to be, I'm, I'm immediately starting to look for, okay, so that's, that's one of my big shadow shapes. Where are my darkest darks going to be and where are my lightest lights? Well, my darkest darks are probably going to be underneath the object. But I don't, again, I don't want that shadow to feel as like a separate, as a separate shape from the rest of, of the trolley. I want that shadow shape to really be sort of mixed in and, and, and joined with, with the trolley itself, with that, that trolley shape. Again, it's, 
Um, I'm not trying to make that really hard right now. I'm trying to keep it nice and soft. Uh, but this being able to having a nice dark underside, that's what's really going to punch that this object exists in 3D space. Uh, something else I'm going to try and consider here as I go forward is atmospheric perspective. Um, if you, you guys haven't heard of atmospheric perspective before, it's uh, basically um, the things that are farther away become lighter because the things that are farther away, you're looking through uh, more air. You're actually looking through more air molecules. And so as things, and you've probably noticed this in real life, as things that are farther away appear lighter, there's actually less contrast in them. So as I go forward, I'm going to try and remember that the stuff that's farther away, like the end, of, and you can really emphasize this as a painter uh, even more than in real life. You know, if you look at the photo, it, it's really hard to tell that there's any atmospheric perspective going on. But um, but as a painter, you can really use that to emphasize that. Even if you're doing like a figure drawing, you know, you can actually emphasize atmospheric perspective, and it really gives um, some of my favorite painters really do that. And so you can already see here by just sort of whitening and reducing the contrast on the back side of the train, the front side of the train is already starting to pull forward here. And getting a nice, uh, you know, a little punch to it, and that's really where I want my attention to be. My focal point, again, it's a pretty simple, simple structured painting, but my, I really want my focal point to be right up here at the front of the cab. Um, and so all this information back here, I'm okay with kind of losing it. I'm, I'm okay with losing that uh, to sort of softness. Um, and we'll talk about edges here in a little bit. Uh, but so I've I've laid out up top here. I've got four values basically. Um, I try and I always try to work in the beginning with with four basic values. I got two lights and two darks, um, and you want to keep those separated. Your lightest light, your uh, your darkest lights must still be brighter than your lightest darks. Uh, I know that's sort of a tongue twister, but um, you have to remember to keep your lights and darks separated. That's what's going to give your painting structure. So we're going to get you know there's there's some dark spots in the inside of the cab as well. We're you know we're looking inside looking inside the cab but again I'm not not too worried about you know details in there right now that's just sort of given given that a little punch you know we've also got these these shapes in terms of the the, the tracks going back and I apologize if, if my marks are a little uh, a little funny um, it's because I'm using I'm actually uh, my Cintiq that I normally use is at work when this whole COVID thing started um, <laughs> the Cintiq I normally use I left at work I, I didn't think we'd actually be gone that long I was like yeah you know we'll, we'll be out for a week or two uh, but, you know, of course, it, it's turned out that we're, it's been over, what, two months now. So I'm, I'm actually working off of an old uh, uh, Wacom pad I've had since, uh, like, the beginning of college. So um, I apologize if, you know, if, if my marks are a bit, uh, you know, if I'm kind of struggling to find my line work here. Uh, that's why, and I apologize. So it looks like my whitest lights are probably going to be, again, we have a light source coming in from here, right? We have a up the... You can tell by the sort of where, where the light is, is hitting the trolley and where the light's hitting the clouds here that really our, our light source is coming in from left to right. And of course, the shadow is telling us as well, that as well. Um, so I'm going to try and design my lightest lights to really help the form, give it a nice punch against the sky. So my looks like my lightest lights will probably be right along here. Uh, the light side of the trolley here is, is pretty bright as well. And then there's sort of going to be a, a rim light along the clouds there. That's going to be bright as well. But I don't, I don't want to come in all here with, with too much white as well, because then, you know, the top of my trolley is going to start to get lost against the sky. And, and I want to maintain some contrast in there. It's okay to have a little bit of white bleed, you know, maybe have a little bit of bleed, something like there. But I, I still want, you know, I don't want to lose the form too much as this is my focal point. I'm much more okay with losing... There's sort of a, a white rim light that goes back along there. I'm okay with losing more of the cab as it goes back, sort of more this way. And by hold, um, little little Photoshop trick by holding and shift and then tapping two points, you can actually create a, a little straight line. You guys probably already know that by now, but um, it really helps when you're trying to do sort of straight perspective lines. I might pop the uh, the contrast back here a little bit slightly. There's a little bit of white just to, to pull. A little bit of that cab forward there. Again, I'm not even working in color yet. I'm just trying to get my value structure formed. And so on the on the topic of, of value structure, I'll go back here to another uh, another thing I want to talk about with you guys, uh, which is value. So value, um, I, I touched on this slightly and on uh, last Monday, but um, the importance of value um, is really you can't can't be understated in painting. 
excuse me, um, color, it's really something you should be considering before color. It's not that color is unimportant. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> it's that um, value is really going to be where your painting gets its structure. It's where you, it's really where the light lives is in value. Um, and so it's, it's more important than I would say more important um, than color because color, color is very relative. Um, and value is, is, is really going to be, if your values are wrong, um, it means your whole lighting scheme is wrong. And even if you have the right colors, you know, your grass is green and your, you know, your sky is blue, it, that doesn't matter. All that really matters is the values. And so I've attached these two paintings here by uh, Greg, Gregor Rakowski. And um, these are one of my favorite illustrators. And you can see here that the paintings, I have them on the left here in color. I also, but I've converted them. I've completely desaturated them, put them in black and white on the right. You can tell they still work. These color paintings still work as black and white images. And so a lot of times if you're working and you find that your, your stuff isn't working, it's probably because uh, your, your painting isn't working as a black and white image. Um, so something I've, I've set up on my computer that I find really helpful in order to ch constantly check my work is I have a little hotkey for control Y where at any moment I can actually completely turn my, uh, my, work, my work black and white. Uh, now I can still actually technically pick colors in, in color there, uh, but it's, it's basically just showing me everything in black and white. So that's a great way for me as I go to check, constantly check my work. And I did this uh, up here, but I, I, went to view, I went to the view tab in Photoshop. I went to proof setup and then I went to custom. And then once I was in custom, I set device to simulate and I set that to dot gain 20%. Um, and basically what that does is that, so when you hit control Y, you get the black and white version of what you're working on. And that's, it just becomes a great way. It's a little trick that uh, Greg Pro taught me at work. And it's a great way to, to check your work as you go. Um, so you may have noticed as I was switching between black and white, um, these two boxes here on the top. And just to prove to you that color, color is, is relative, but values, values is really good where you're going to get your contrast. I've included a, a red and blue rectangle up at the top and a red and blue rectangle at the bottom. The red and blue rectangle at the bot at the top, um, you know, you're perceiving a contrast right there because these are two very different colors. They're contrasting colors. Um, and so you perceive a difference between those two rectangles. Same at the bottom, uh, but you'll notice when I go to black and white, the top for the top one, the contrast is gone. And why is that? Well, that's because the value is the same. The actual white dark quality of that color at the top is the same. And so if you're painting and you're, you're putting contrasting colors in there, but you're not really putting contrasting values, you'll find that you're not actually getting white contrast, right? At the bottom here, I actually have a white red and a dark blue. And that's where you'll, you're still able to perceive the difference between those shapes. But at the top, the red and the blue, they're the same value. There's no contrast. So that's something to be aware of as you're painting. If you're finding that, you know, you're throwing all this color on there, but nothing's really punching, it's probably because your values are off. Uh, you, you need to check your values. So really, really important. Um, also on the on the topic of values is, is, is your composition, right? And so um, these are... Uh, these are images from the great Andrew Loomis, um, who also, he's the one who, who kind of passed along the Howard Pyle theory. And he, these are all sort of thumbnail paintings he did with just four tones, with just the four, as I mentioned earlier, the, the two light tones and the two dark tones. And you can see here, all these paintings punch, all these paintings work, even though they're really only done with a dark black, a, white, a dark gray, light gray, and a white. You can see the structure here. All these paintings work, and you can see how you can really build a painting with just those four tones alone. And these could become color as long as the colors are in line with and match those tones as well. Um, and so, the, and they could be whatever color you want—pinks, blues, purples. It, the, as long as the colors were to go in there and actually match the tone, you'd be all right. And so, really, I, I can't stress enough. And this is actually probably my weakest point as a painter: is is value composition and and, and value. Uh, value design. Um, it's something I'm really trying to get better at. It, it's, it was really a, a weak point for me when I started painting. And, and so um, it's something I'm, I'm just sort of gradually trying to improve with over time. And so if I go here and I hit control Y, I can now see that top image, my reference image there in black and white. Uh, and you can see, even though I, I've got the front of the, the, the cab sort of lighter, um, the cab itself is a fairly uh, dark object. I'm still going to try, however, to keep, to maintain my separation between this shadow shape here on the right and uh, and this sort of white, the white in front of the cab. However, there is 
because the front of the cab is sort of a curved surface, there is a bit of a shadow affecting that sort of right side of the cab. So I want to illustrate that. However, I'm still going to try, this is one of my half tones that I was mentioning earlier. I still want to try and keep it in the light category. And I want to try and keep my, my half tones in the shadow and in, in the darker category. I'm going to make them darker than they should, than they should be. Right. And so there's still a sort of perceived separation between my, my lights and my darks. Now the sky, if actually we look at the sky up here, you may think, oh, the sky is light. Well, you know, if you look at the, the actual blue up there, that, that sky is actually uh, probably more, more in line with sort of my light gray midtone. It's certainly in the light, but it's, it's a fairly, you know, it's a fairly uh, a dark object there. And that's, again, that's how I'm going to get some contrast there in the sky. You know, so when you, when you think, when you're thinking of what colors to pick, don't just think of, oh, sky, light blue. Think about the value you're adding. Right, because you could, I could make that sky green or red if I wanted it. If I did, it, it wouldn't really affect the structure of the painting too much. It might affect the mood, and you might be getting people asking, like, "Huh, why is the sky red?" Uh, but you know, it's it's really in terms of the actual structure of the light, the tone is really where you're going to get. That's a little too dark, probably. The tone is really where you're going to get your structure. Also, that grass there is actually a fairly deep tone, and I'm going to actually utilize that to punch the front of the cab here a little bit. By putting your light, the, the more the, your contrast is going to come from putting your lights against your darks. And so, if I have a, a fairly dark object here, and, and I'm trying to emphasize the light edge of the of the trolley, I'm probably going to actually punch that more than the image does. You're not you're not slave to the image. And this is something that it's taken me a while to learn. Can add some atmosphere in the distance because this is my horizon line right through the center. But you're not you're not slave to your reference images. Learn from it, but don't be slave to it. Don't be slave to your reference. Um, and I, I can't stress that enough. That's where you come in as the painter. It's, you're not a photo, you're not a camera. You know, your job as a painter isn't, to, you know, we have incredible cameras now that can pick up on incredible amounts of detail. Um, you know, your, it's not your job to be a camera. Your job as a, as a painter is because you have something to say, you want to interpret, right? And for me, I love, I love the, I love the front of this old, of this old cab car. I love the articulation of it. And I may just, I'm trying to emphasize this sort of the glory, the wonderful design of this old piece of, of machinery. I've also got some buildings in the background here in New Orleans, but I don't like them that much. Uh, they're sort of boring. Um, there's, they're, and I want to give them more of a, I want to give them a little bit more, uh, make them a little more interesting. So I'm actually going to make them a little bit more like skyscrapers probably. Give them more of that classic Give them more of a, a classic, you know, standing out image there and create a little bit of a, of a hierarchy popping out there. You know, that, that strikes me as a little more interesting than these really blow, flat, boring uh, buildings over there. Also, something I, I want to pay attention to as I'm drawing is that we've got some great directional lines uh, in this painting. These sort of these cables for uh, that, that power the trolley and the, and, the, and the tracks as well. These are going to be great directional lines. Um, and the directional lines are re really going to help punch your image as you go. So you want to really so find that nice directional line of the shadow there. And then we've got this, this cool little, uh, you know, post here that's, that's holding up the cables. These directional lines, and I'll probably come in and, and really do these nice in a nice finished way in the end. But just as I start, I want to get them in there. Because they're kind of, they're really helping, helping emphasize that perspective, right? Got the actual cable bit on top. We got a nice little cable line there. So you know, okay, I'm starting to get something in, in terms of value structure that I, that I feel happy with. I'm probably going to punch my cab windows here with a little more darks because this is really where my focal point is really where I want my lightest lights and my darkest darks. So I'm going to start trying to punch some nice darks in there. Let's start around the, the front here.
you can already see the general the general three dimensionality of the object starting to come out hopefully and um, this is sort of how I like to work I like to like over time gradually pull out my forms I like to find my work over time and in you know it, it may seem a little sloppy and it is it's 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 sort of a, a rough way to work but it's it's how I like to uh, it's how I like to work you know and here's an interesting well this this is a little thing but here's areas that sort of start to become a problem you really want to watch out for tangencies so right here I want to really try and emphasize the corner of my trolley here but I've also got this line that's sort of terminating right at that at that point and I don't like that um, you want to really watch out for those those points that that make awkward tangencies um, tangency is something you may you may recognize from from math class so I'm actually going to redesign the image slightly so that that line so that these lines really lead is dis read as distinct from one another I'm going to have this that part of the track terminate more in that straight edge of the trolley there so that yeah so now that now that reads is a little more distinct now. It's not kind of making an awkward intersection with the trolley. The trolley is able to stand out a bit more now. And, and as a result, you kind of read the dimensionality of the trolley piece there a bit better. And feel free, you guys, if you, if you have questions as I go, stuff you, you know, if there's stuff you'd like me to sort of focus on, um, feel free to, to, to chime in and, and ask a question. So I'm, I'm get I'm almost I'm almost happy with with my with my basic value structure here. Yeah, it's simple simple painting, you know. Um, but the little shadow coming across there. Actually, I'll start to try and pull out some of the forms in the front. If I zoom back and look at it in thumbnail, yeah, that, that that's starting to work. It's starting to work. Few things maybe I should should be attentive to here. This right side isn't popping as much as I'd like it to, so I'll punch I'll punch my lights there. There we go. Now the front of the trolley cab is going to punch a little better. So I highly recommend before you just go throwing color everywhere, get your value structure right. That's going to be where your painting lives and dies. If you get that right, then you can have fun with color later, not worrying too much about it. This yellow, you can see, is sort of a white tone. So I'm actually going to go in and sort of start to again hit, come in here with some lights. It's sort of a difficult perspective to, to hit there. Yeah, I'm really not used to using this this pad. I apologize. Okay. Yeah, not really fussing too much with detail right now. Just trying to get a good structure in there. I'll try and pull out the shape there a little bit more. Okay with having some white bleed there. You know, having points where, especially on rounded objects, I really like to, to emphasize, you know, have points of what I call white bleed, where the white's really refracting off and sort of uniting with the incoming light. Um, it's just sort of a nice way to, to show reflected light, uh, you know, in, in a painting. Something I kind of like to do. You don't have to, though. More of a style choice. Yeah, just always trying to remember my white source is here, coming in left, kind of upper, upper left, down to right. I can probably punch, punch down here a little bit more even. Okay. Get some more contrast in the shadow there. All right. So, you know, nothing that impressive, but hopefully you can see there's something coming together here, right? Um, the general structure is there. So now um, we'll start to we'll start to think about color as we go ahead. And um, also, I'm going to talk about edges here a little bit. Everything I'm doing right now, I'm just using with a generic round brush. And if we have time, I'll, I'll come in in the end with with maybe something of, with a brush with a bit of texture. 
and uh, try to do something that's uh, you know a little bit more rough or, or give it give it some nice texture because I love to work with texture, but I'm I'm just using the round right now because I I want to show you guys that um, not to I, I want to try and teach you guys not to get too hung up on the brush you're using that so so much of what you do can just be used with your generic round um, and that's where really when you want to design all your structure in that way brushes can be very tempting to dive right into. Um, but if you really aren't getting your basics right, then you're just sort of sugarcoating your, your painting, not really solving its fundamental issues. Um, but as I go through, you, you may have noticed I've, I've got some parts that, of the, the trolley that are sort of loose and unresolved, and I've got other parts where I'm trying to keep a little bit sharper. Um, and that's because there's really three, so I guess technically four, but three, three uh, edge types I want you guys to think about as, as you're painting. Uh, your resolved edges or, or hard edges, your soft edges, and your lost edges. And this is really where a lot of your mood is going to come into your image. Um, on the top here is a painter I really like, Mark Legou. Um, he really throws a lot of soft and lost edges into his work. And I, I just love it. I, I think it gives the work so much uh, mood and atmosphere and depth. But you can see um, it doesn't necessarily lose a realistic quality because his values are correct. And because the areas that are, are sharp and resolved are very, are very uh, accurate in terms of the draftsmanship. He's able to get away with so much just lost and unresolved points of the painting. He he gives you just enough information to let your eye fill in the rest, and um, that's something I think as a painter, it should be a should be a goal for all of us to achieve. Same with with Craig Mullins. Um, Craig Mullins is a great digital illustrator, and you can see you know there's a lot of lost ed edges and combined shapes. Right, this whole you know the hair and and the hat here is all combined into one shape. All the front of the coat is combined into one shape. You know, but um, he's very, he's very uh, careful in where he puts his contrast, right? And really, um, this is your resolved, your your hard edges and your resolved edges um, as a painter are going to be where you want uh, the eye to really go. You that's where you really want the most information, right? So in here, it's that eye, right? The lightest light and the darkest dark are really, you know, that's probably here and, and right against the eye. Um, here, it's you know, you're getting some nice contrast in the back there, but really in the foreground objects as well. Um, the more, the more resolved it is, the harder your edge, the more it's going to contrast. And so your, the eyes naturally want to going to go there. So if you want that to stand out, you have to contrast that hard resolved bit against softer unresolved areas. And that's really where the design of your painting comes in. You really have to design, decide as a painter, where do you really want people looking, right? Where do you really want people noticing, um, what, what, are you editing out it? You're sort of an editor as a painter. You're sort of taking what's in front of you and you're picking and choosing. And just remember, think of yourself as an editor. You're not beholden to your, to your reference, but you have to learn from your reference and you have to respect it. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to, I'm going to start to think about color. Um, and one thing I, you know, I could just start color picking from a photo, but I, I, I really want to try not to do that. Um, I'm going to start another layer here for my color. Um, I just, I think that's a little cheap. What I'm, what I'm going to try and think about instead, instead of just stealing the color from, from my photo, I'm going to try and think about color temperatures. So something uh, very important to think about when you start to throw color on as well is your temperatures. Um, your actual reds, greens, purples, blues, that doesn't matter as much as the actual temperature scale. And uh, temperature is more, your your cools are gonna be like your sort of more, your your blues and your uh, your purples and sort of, sort of maybe this part of the spectrum and your warms are gonna be more the edges of the spectrum here if you're looking at my swatch tab. Um, and, and the reason that's important to keep in mind is because the way light works is that if you have warm light coming in, your shadows are gonna be cool. And if you have cool light work coming in, your shadows are going to be warm. And that's just how nature works. That's how nature resolves itself. And so it's just a good rule of thumb to keep as you're painting. Uh, warm light, cool shadows. Cool light, warm shadows. Uh, remember that as you're painting. And so in this, uh, looking at this painting up here, it's looking like, I'm looking at the shadow. The shadow is looking pretty cool. Even though the, the, this area is a, is a deep red, it's really sort of a cool red. Um, because it's, you know, the, the local color is red, but it's being highly affected by a cool shadow. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a fairly sunny day. So we're getting sort of a, a warm light coming in from the upper left, right? It's a sunny, you know, sunny day. And, and so that means we've got a warm light and we've got cool shadow. 
Um, so I'm just gonna try and think about that as I as I go. Um, I'm gonna find sort of a just a you know sort of a nice cyanish blue here. Um, that I'm just gonna use as my base, and I'm, I'm not too concerned with the specifics of this color right now, more the value. Um, but I'm just gonna give all my shadows just a basic cool, just a cool tone. Just a basic temperature there. That's gonna unite all that. A cool tone. All right, where else have I got shadow? Well, I've got a little bit of shadow under the rails here, yeah. And especially out here, the, the shadow out here is going to be wider, and it's also going to be reflecting the, the sky, so that's going to have a nice, cool texture to it as well. I'll lighten that a little bit. Being careful not to light it too much. I still want to maintain that it's a shadow in terms of its value. Okay. I'll keep that fairly white there. Now I'm going to go in with a basic warm tone. And uh, it, there's a lot of heavy primary colors going on in this image. You've got a really strong green, a really strong blue, a really strong red. Um, I'm going to try and keep this painting a little bit more in a color family. And what I mean by that is, is I'm not, I don't have to come in with a hard blue, hard green primary color. Um, a lot of great paintings, you, you'd actually be surprised as how few colors they actually use to complete a painting. Um, so I'm actually going to use sort of as a, my basic tone for the whole image, this red. This red is so strong that I'm just going to sort of try and make that the primary. I'm going to try and keep most of the white whites in the image in the red family. And maybe this won't work as well as I'm as I'm envisioning in my head, but that's OK, you know. Um, but what I really, something I, I found I struggled with early on was that I just immediately started throwing too many colors into my painting. And as a result, as a result, it's sort of, uh, it, it would just be very jarring. The painting would become extremely, extremely jarring. You don't want that. You can get away with using very few colors. And I'm going to try and do that as I go. Now the sky is of course blue, so I do want to show that, but what I'm instead of just going in and picking a blue, I'm gonna try it just sort of play with my CYMK sliders up here. Try to find a blue that's that's still kind of friendly to the complementary to the red family. I'm just gonna sort of start to cool down my sky there. It's gonna build up to it gradually as opposed to just going in really sharply. Build up, build up, work up to it. My grass is going to be kind of cooler in here. The grass has a hint of green. All you need is just enough of the color to push it over the edge. Remember, trying to remember that we've got that really bright. One of my brightest lights in the image is is that rim light along the cloud. So I don't I don't want to lose that. I want to try and as I go, I want to remember where my lightest lights are. Now this is a really if you look at the the color swatch I'm doing on the image here, this is a heavily saturated red. It's a really, really strong red um, on that train car. So I'm going to kind of finally come in and kind of toss that on there. I'm not just going to color pick. I'm going to kind of customize my red here a little bit. But I'm going to really punch. You know, I'm going to use a color layer. A color layer comes in with just pure the, the color without disrupting the values too much. Um, and so I'm going to try and do that. I'm going to come in here with a, with a really strong first base layer of red. Okay, that's not bad. Trying to lose a little bit more in the atmosphere there. That's not too bad. I, I, I have a really bad habit of, of, of constantly adding layers to my work. I, I highly suggest, you know, trying to keep your layers, your layers simple. 
Um, it's just a bad habit I have that I'm trying to break. See, I'm starting to lose some of the value contrast in here. I want to try and get some of that back. Uh, so I'm going to reinsert some, some more shadow tone here. I remind you that this is in shadow. And the inside of that train car, well, that's cool. That's not a being affected by the warm outside light. That's cool in there. Lighten up my green out here. And now I'm starting to lose some of my line work. As I've been painting, I'm starting to lose sort of my my line and, and if you ever find that if your painting starting to get a little bit muddy it's always good to go back and reassert your lines reassert the drawing something greg pro is constantly telling me and i'm not sure i completely understand him yet but he's constantly saying that paint paint paints like you're drawing and uh, you know which has always just felt like a weird concept to me but the more i learn the more I kind of start to get is that you're actually, it's a reminder that you're not just tossing, you know, swatches of paint on there. You're actually trying to sculpt the form in the same way that when you're drawing, you're really trying to emphasize the form of the shapes. Painting is very similar. Now, I really want this red to pop in the front here, and it's difficult because this is a curved surface. The local color is red, but I also want to show that it's being affected by the white. And so something to remember about local color, local color is the term for, for the actual true color of an object, right? The true color of the object is, is, this, is this red paint, right? Um, but that red paint is being affected in so many different dimensions by the actual, you know, by the, the, by its relationship to the light. So the true red, where I'm going to put my true red is actually just before the shadow begins. Um, the local color lives best really right on the cusp. You see the shadow sort of starts to begin over here. The, the true red lives right at, right before that shadow. And so where my biggest, most truest, most saturated primary red is going to live is really sort of right in here, right down the center there. And that's a little bit too, that's a bit too cool of a red. I'm going to maybe do something a little, a little warmer in here. It's really that your, my local red, it's going to live right in there. You know, I'm not too happy with how this is coming along, but you know, it's it's going okay. And hopefully you see that I'm, I'm just trying to keep it basic, keep the structure, keep the structure right. Oops, sorry there. I don't know why that's starting to yell at me. Punch, punch that out against the clouds there. Remember that I want that light bloom kind of coming in there. Something that I, I kind of like to do right around here is, okay, I've, I've got something going. Um, the basic values are in there. Eh, probably go darker under it. Um, so I'm actually going to insert some black black and they really try to punch the underside again i'm starting to check my work I'm starting to check my work here with the control y i'm going you know what there's not enough you know the contrast really isn't reading right i've got color on there but the contrast is not popping too much so that's a good reminder to me to come back in you know reassert my lights and darks work out my lights and dark structure And this is, again, this is something I have to constantly remind myself as a painter as I start to toss color in there and I get carried away with color. 
you need that light dark structure to work. having trouble kind of popping the front of the cab there. So I'm going to put a really nice white against there. Boom. Now, okay, now the front of the cab, that's starting to read nicely. Okay, not fussing too much with details, but I am thinking about form. I am trying to think about sculpting out the form of this object. And better painters than I can do this process much, much quicker. Again, where was my darkest darks? Well, I've got the nice darks in there at my focal point, but I've also got some under the chassis of the trolley. I want to punch those. Again, remembering my atmospheric perspective, I don't want to get too dark as I go back there because then I start to lose that atmospheric perspective. But really want, especially in the front, that to pop forward and I can actually probably want too dark going back there so I'm going to try and lighten that a bit. Okay. Okay, so now if I come back, well, I'm just throw some lights in there. I, I'm going to start to sculpt out the door here a little bit. But you'll notice once I come back in by holding shift here I'm getting some nice orthogonal some nice straight orthogonal lines there. Mm, not a fan of that. And I'm constantly, you know, this is something uh, I can do digitally, but not not necessarily in, in real painting. Is if I make a stroke, I don't like it. Control Z. You know, I've always I'm always kind of make you know playing around with my strokes until I like them. But you want you don't want to get too much into that habit because the best painters don't have to. Okay. Pulling out that form. So now if I go back to my color, okay, okay. So you see now it's starting to punch a lot better now. My color is a little weird, but that's okay. The value structure is getting better. You got to go back and forth. Make sure you're not losing your value structure in your in your color. You know, and I may just be able to. That's that sky is is gotten a bit dark. I can pop that out a bit more. Again, just sort of working up to it, working up to it. And I'm actually gonna. The sky is actually affecting quite a. You know, it. The ground is reflecting the sky, so I can actually come in here and reassert the sky, especially in the clouds. The clouds are going to be reflecting that coolness. So even though I went in with that lots of red initially, I'm just working it back, working it back, trying to bring everything back into its, into its family. Something you can do as well is I've just got a, a standard triangle on my on my Wacom tablet. It, it works really well if you actually have a Cintiq with the screen on it, but because yeah, I'm having trouble matching the angle on on this just uh, on this side on this side tab. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, but you, if you have a Cintiq where you're actually drawing on the screen, um, using you can just use your basic drafting tools. You know, like your your triangles, your straight edges. Now I'm starting to lose the city. I'm starting to lose the city back there. So I'm going to try and pop it out again. Reduce my opacity. Okay. 
going to add a basic gradation of light coming in from the top. Adding gradations into your work is also what's going to help keep it from, from becoming flat. So what I'm doing right now is I'm adding a little more atmosphere, a little more lightness at the top so that it, everything gets a little bit richer, a little bit darker as it comes to the bottom. So, okay, you know, I'm starting to get something that's, you know, starting to get somewhere with this. Uh, so I think I'll go back to some other things I want to teach you guys. Um, one thing that absolutely crucial, uh, is good shapes in painting. Uh, again, as I, was men as I was mentioning earlier, you want to combine your shapes, you want to combine, um, you want to simplify your forms. Uh, you really want to think as you're going along, what are those uh, big uh, focal point shapes that you want to work with? And then what are the supporting shapes? And then what are the things that you can lose? Uh, and so you, you can see these in these images are at the top by Krinz Gushart. Um, how much information he's actually losing, how much information he's actually cutting away. He's just purely thinking about what are the big shapes that I'm working with. And you can see the paintings are already, like, especially this one on the right, it's already working. Even though it's done in like two or three tones, uh, probably four, um, you can already see that the whole structure of the painting is there. I totally know that this is a this is some sort of like, you know, old ancient street. Uh, I can tell with the little antennas and things. Um, very simple, but the structure is there. And so it's already working. Um, and then you can see he's gotten a little more detailed with this one on the left. But if you look at how much information he's just combined in the shadows, right? This big triangle of light here, these squares, of, these rectangles of light. It's a fair, you know, he's just thinking about big compositional shapes. And the details, you know, are like little gems that come in and make it sing. Um, but, you know, the actual structure is all there from the beginning. And if I do the control Y, yeah, you can see it all works great in black and white. Same with this stuff down below. Uh, Marco Butti is a YouTube channel. I, I highly recommend checking out um, a lot of the principles I'm talking about. He goes much more into depth uh, in them there, and and uh, he's a better painter than I am. So you know, check him out. Um, I've learned a lot from a lot from him. Um, again, thinking about you know, this is not how Venice actually looks, but he's sort of stylized it and and by breaking it down into good, just good shapes, right? Uh, same here, just big, good shapes. So putting good shape structure into your image. Uh, is something uh, very, very good. And, and so in thinking about shapes, I've been sort of working loose here for a while. I'd, I'd like to assert a little bit more of a hard edge to it. And so I'm actually going to go in and just really quickly toss a cutout filter on this. And again, not that I'm encouraging working with filters, but too much, but I just find that every now and then, okay, so, sort of helps to sharpen your work a little bit. So I've come back in and, and yeah, it's, it's a little bit edgy, but you know, I kind of like what's happening here. It, it sort of helped me understand my, my shapes a little bit more. Um, and so I'm actually going to just now start working on top of this with a round brush that's slightly smaller. I'm going to get a little bit more fussy with my work now. Again, in the beginning, I was just sort of trying to feel it all out. Just sort of trying to feel it all out in the beginning. Now I'm, I'm going to start to get a little bit fussier on my opacity back up again. Always remembering my reference image. And we can actually get, we can get blue, we can get more, more blue in that. Starting to lose the palette of the, of the painting. I don't like that. Again, if this painting point turns out poor, I apologize. But you know, like we were talking about before, don't be afraid to make bad drawings. Don't be afraid to make bad paintings. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Just have fun with it. That's how you'll learn. Do you guys have questions as I'm going along? Stuff, uh, any specifics you'd like to ask? Anything you're specifically curious about uh, that maybe I can cover before we're done? I know we're starting to run, probably we're starting to run into an hour now. Um, so just let me know. Let me know if there's anything specifically you have, you have questions for or stuff you'd like to ask about. Is 
there a specific reason why you use the uh, CMYK instead of RGB or? Um, uh, it's it's more of a personal preference, uh, honestly. Um, I just I, I prefer I prefer for me working with temperatures. I like I like I feel like I have more control over the color temperature with the CYMK, uh, but ultimately it's it's not you know it's not extraordinarily. Um, you know, it's it's not right or wrong, whatever you you choose to do. It's just more of a personal preference for me because again, I'm I'm trying to focus less on the actual, you know, uh, red, blue, red, blue, green. I'm trying to focus more on the actual temperature uh, of the color, and that and I just feel like I have more control in these dials here. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, but there's there's no, it's not like right or wrong. It's just a personal preference. Also, do you have any recommendations for drawing water, like ocean or rivers for, and stuff? For drawing water, um, you know, I'm always, whenever I hear, do you have recommendations for drawing anything? Um, the principles of, draw, of drawing apply to all things. You know, it's, yeah, sure, some things are more difficult than others. The, the only thing I would actually say is, is you know, people are, are extremely difficult, and that's that's not because people are are differently affected by by the laws of light and shadow. It's because we we have such a high standard for how we perceive people um, that we immediately notice if anything is off in, in how we and how we draw people. Right. So, um, drawing people can be difficult just because it, it's it's a lot more uh, demanding in, in order to get it right. Uh, water, water similarly is, is difficult because there's a lots of, and I would say with water, you're, water's difficult because you're actually looking through it, right? You're actually looking into a, a three-dimensional liquid that's being affected in so many different, by so much refracted, refractive light as it goes deeper. Um, and by that, I would just say, look at reference, use reference images, look at reference images, um, and don't just try to paint the water, don't just go blue, boom try to paint the water in layers and depth. And I would just say water is one of those things that I think you, you just sort of have to build up with many different layers over time to just sort of try and give it that richness, that quality um, that makes it that makes it sing like there's there's more than just a surface level blue there, right? Uh, if you just paint it flat with just a basic blue, it, it ain't gonna work. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I'm starting to get a little stuck here in this painting again. Just trying to reassert, reassert my lights and darks. Gonna look, gonna get a little sharper now. You know, getting a little fussier with it. So sort of start to indicate detail. Not too worried about it right now. I just want to show that something's there. I'm starting to lose the contrast there, so I'm going to make that a deeper, deeper green. I want to emphasize the front of the trolley. There we go. That's got more punch to it now. Sky in the background. What are the questions you guys got? Oh, I have a question. Sure. So when you merge layers, mm -hmm. um, is there a specific time when you should be doing it or does it really matter? 
Um, I do it probably a bit too much, actually. Um, I have a I have a bad habit of flattening everything as I go along because I tend to build up a lot of uh, a lot of excess layers. Um, so getting working on developing good habits in terms of your layer structure is is really really important. I'm actually, starting to lose the perspective here a little bit. Reassert that perspective. Um, I when I find I usually flatten when I find that the layers are becoming unmanageable when I just have too many that I don't know if I'm painting on top or below stuff, you know, that's when I just go, okay, I've got to flatten this thing and, 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 uh, you know, just simp break it back down again, almost bring it back down to a, a real life painting, you know, um, really if, if I'm having trouble cognitively processing all that my different layers, that's when I flatten it. Um, because it's just it's no longer helpful. However, getting better at at building a layer structure that you yourself can process, help, and, and understand, um, you'll you'll actually do. The more you can do that, the better off you'll be. And something I've I've found at work a lot is, especially if if I'm doing a complex piece that I need to send over to the media team, um, that because they, they're going to animate it, they want to have all those layers in there. And my process is just sort of naturally to flatten stuff as I go. Uh, not to build up too many layers because I, I like to kind of you know pull stuff out of pull stuff out and um, so I'm trying to get better myself at not constantly flattening my work uh, but you know I would say if, if you're just if the if the layers are ceasing to become a helpful tool for you and if they're just becoming a pain then it, it's time to flatten you know um, and just and, and try again and as you go try to reassert a, a healthier a better structure um, as you go, uh, if if the if the layers aren't helping you, then you know what, you know it's there to help you. It's there to be a tool, right? And so if, if it's just causing you mental ache and pain, then you know what, <laughs> that's not doing its job, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my other question is about your uh, the draw the pad you're using. Mm -hmm. um, so you said you're using a Wacom pad. Yes. Uh, is it one with a screen on the pad or? No, it's not. And uh, <laughs> I, I've gotten so, I have to say, I've gotten so used to working with the with the screen one. Uh, I've been a little bit spoiled by that. And so, <laughs> you know, the fact that I, I don't have that is, 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 is a little bit difficult on me right now. And so my line work is, is kind of, I'm, I'm really not happy with my line work as, as I've been doing this piece, you know, but that's okay. You know, live and learn. Um, Try and pop a little bit of this of a sign there, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm, do, I'm not using one that has that has the uh, that has a screen on it, and so um, that's why I was mentioning earlier. You know, if you have one with the screen, you can actually uh, use your straight edges and, and stuff like that. Something you know, I, I would have probably would have normally done in this piece is actually I would have been using one of my triangles or straight edges to kind of, to try and keep my edges kind of more clear and defined, my perspective lines more clear and defined. So I'm actually gonna go in with the select tool, the select tool now and sort of mask stuff out to try and get a little bit more definition in, in, in what I'm doing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I highly recommend getting one with the screen. I just, I think it's... Uh, yeah, oh yeah, it's, uh, I have one with the screen. <laughs> nice, <laughs> I'm very jealous right now. <laughs> <laughs> Some lines right there. I try not to use the masks too much, you know, because I, I, I'd like for the piece to, to sort of read with my signature, the signature of my hand, but, you know, um, really kind of struggling with the, uh, with the, with this right now, with this, uh, using this pad. So just want to try and get some sharp lines back into here. I wanted this to feel loose, but you know, I'm starting to, it's everything's starting to feel kind of a little bit too muddy for me. So I'm trying to reassert some sharps and in, back in there, give it a little bit more uh, definition, especially on the, I really want the front of this trolley to sing nicely. So, and that's, you know, my edge work, here's a great example. This is really poor edge work right in here. This is not, well, the reason this isn't contrasting great is because this, you see how sloppy this edge stuff in, is in here. I need to clean that up. So I'm going to, I'm going to try that. 
going to come in here with this select tool. I'm just going to try and clean, give that a nice clean edge. I'm going to work it from both sides. So I've I'm, right now I'm selected on the inside here. Uh, you know, this this is also a bit too pale. I'm going to want the main bit of my local color to sing in the center. I'm a really bad multitasker, guys, so I apologize if, if I'm just sort of, you know, treading water out here. But a little bit. Got more of a clean edge there. Yeah, okay, that's that's popping a little better. Actually, I'm going to go back to my select tool, and now I'm going to work it from the other side. So I'm going to inverse that selection. I'm going to bump, bump that up there. Okay. Okay. There we go. That's that's reading, that's reading sharper now. Already, I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable with how this is coming together. Um, you know, something you can also do that I do sometimes. I'm not too keen on the color palette I've got right now, so I've just copied and, and, and duplicated what I've got here. I'm just going to go through into here. Um, you can play with these auto auto tones, auto contrasts. I like to do that sometimes. Um, but again, it's, it's easy for it to become a crutch. Uh, not too keen on that. Um, it's easy for it to become a crutch, so don't let it become a handicap for you. But you can also come here and play with the hue saturation. Yeah, I'm kind of liking that a little better. You can just fudge the dial slightly, bump the saturation a little more. Boom. Okay. There we go. Starting to sing a little bit better. Merge that back down. There we go. Now, stuff like these windows here, there's a lot of details in these windows. So your initial temptation is going to be to go through and just draw every little detail in those windows. But instead, think of it as a big shape. It's Right now, it's one big rectangle. So just think about it as a big shape. And again, it's also more of the lost portion of, of my image, right? I've chosen to make this whole right side of the trolley sort of a lost part of the drawing. Um, I want It's such a long, continuous, boring shape. I wanted to break it up and, and kind of um, keep it somewhat interesting. We keep that atmospheric perspective in there. A little too contrasty back there on the horizon. There we go. Yeah. That's starting to punch a bit more. Just as you go, think about the big shapes. What are the biggest shapes you're trying to communicate here? Again, still working with big shapes, not getting too hung up on all the different little mullions. Just the basic. Work from big shapes to small shapes. Big shapes to small shapes. That must be your process. You can't start with the small shapes. You can't start in a little corner of the image here going, uh, you know, mullions, mullions. No. That's the end stuff. In the beginning, in, in phases like this, and this is just a, a thumbnail sketch, really, um, you're working. You're working with big shapes. I kind of want to assert the perspective inside. That's getting a little sloppy here. So I want that to read nice and sharp again. 
and this is my focal point so i need this the front of the cab here to be nice and sharp and all the, the sort of scrubbing with my round brush isn't really helping read this read is sharp so I go, okay, I got to come back in with some nice, hard, remember when I was talking about resolved, hard, like nice, hard and resolved edges versus lost edges. This stuff can give me come lost, but this is my focal point. I can't let this get too lost. I want a nice, crisp little rim across the top here. I'm going to assert that with the selection tool. And lightest darks, lightest lights and darkest darks. That's your focal point. That's what's drawing your eye up here. No, okay. It's, so now, all right. Dimensionally, I'm I'm starting to like how that's how that's reading a bit better. Um, though I'm start to, starting to notice some perspective issues with with the image. So. You know, if you notice here, um, the front of the cab, it, it's, it's dipping a little bit lower down to the right, and mine's kind of perking up here a little bit. So I'm going to just grab this piece, and I'm, I'm going to manipulate it slightly. So I just copied that and pasted it. You see my new layer here. I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to just warp it a little bit. Always good to make sure your perspectives... All right, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's that's starting to that's starting to look more correct. Okay. Again, I got a little too fussy with this with these little signage pieces up here, so I'm just going to re come in here and reestablish these as sharp yellow rectangles, and then I can come in later and do all that little you know signage detail in there. Again, just using this as a mask right now. Just going in there. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you know what? I'm going to keep that selection to make that dimensional. You know, there's there's a little bit of shadow under dipped under there. I'm just going to come through and use that selection tool to make a nice little cast shadow under there so you know. These, this plane is below the plane in front of it. Actually, I kind of like that little reflection there. Yeah. Perspective's a little wonky. So that's all right. I'm going to correct it. Don't be afraid to sort of cut up your painting a little bit and just sort of correct your your perspective. Slightly better. There's a nice deep, ditch, deep, rich red here. Up here, it's still kind of light, again, in terms of the value. So I want to reassert that strong local red that I've kind of got going down at the bottom. See how it's got this nice deep red right before the shadow begins? Yeah, here we go. Right there. Yep, okay. That's looking better. I sort of have these just sort of marks. And again, there, there's no mark on the trolley actually that's like that, but. You know, it's just for me, it's just sort of a hashing to try and indicate that the form is turning as you know, this surface is turning. Okay. All right. It's 
guy is getting a little fussy up there. I don't need this guy to be that contrasty. Can put some nice light bloom. Yeah, light bloom. I like some. I like some light bloom in my work. It's a bit cheesy, but uh, I think it just helps pop that a little bit. And that'll get that'll get painted back with time again. I've almost completely lost my buildings in the back, so I want to reassert those. You know, I'm just trying to make. Eh, I'm not, not keen about that sharp shape there. Trying to keep keep them a little more traditional. Avoid the tangency with that pull. Again, I hope you guys can see. I'm just sort of slowly building up to something here. I, I the way I like I like to work from soft. To hard, I like to work from from just sort of very loose and 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 rough to something a little bit sharper. I like to sort of find my my forms as I go. Not not everybody likes to work that way, and I'm not saying it's the right way. It's just sort of how I prefer to work. I'm going to inverse that selection just to reemphasize. Pop those, reduce the opacity here a little bit. Uh, pop these buildings out against the sky a little bit more. That's a little too strong. Something like that. Even that, I would say, is just probably too strong. Again, thinking about the values of that, I don't want it to compete with what's happening in the front too much. Just an indication. Losing it in the atmosphere. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm kind of happy with what's starting to show up here. Um, it's it's about now that I can probably think start thinking more about texture. Again, all this has really just been done with, with a round brush and a selection tool, so the edges aren't all that interesting, but hopefully you can see that the dimensionality of the form is, is starting to pull out here. Um, so one thing I can do, I've actually got my stamp tool set up with a whole bunch of these really interesting uh, just sort of grungy patterns that I created from other people's paintings. I just find these sort of swatchy bits of, of, of painting that, that, you know, create sort of from other, from other painters that has got some nice texture to it. So um, this is where I can start coming in and I'm actually going to create another layer for this. I'm just going to layer on just some bits of texture. You can upload your own, you know, images. You can into the into the clone stamp tool. I'm not too concerned with exactly what it is. It's, it's just sort of it's just sort of texture. It's 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 grit for the the surface of the painting. And now I'm going to play around with the with the actual layer, um, with the layer uh, you know, modifier here. Um, right now it's been set to normal. I'm just going to click into it and start to run down the line of different layer types and qualities and see if there's one that strikes my fantasy again. I'm trying to keep add texture without losing the value too much. I kind of like that. That's given a nice vivid vivid light in there. I don't like what that's doing. It's a little strong on the green over there, but that's okay. You know, come into it again, duplicate it, play around with it some more. Soft light. Mm. Yeah, I kind of like how that's. I kind of like how that's working. Uh, except that grass is really strong, so I'm going to have to knock that back. Going to remerge everything that I'm doing. I'm just going to say to that grass, you know, just a little too strong and knock you back just a bit. Let me start my horizon.
So my sky's getting a little bit funky. So I'm starting to lose my definition between the sky and the clouds. That's right, it's set to low opacity. Feel free to chime in with some more questions. You know, it, as I start to, to wrap this up, if, if you guys, you know, if there's specific stuff you want to see, um, I begin to try. I know we're probably, we're already quite over time now. Um, so uh, I'd like to use the final time we've got just, you know, with specific, anything specific you guys want to ask or, or, or you're curious about, or maybe there's so many different ways I, I could I could take the painting from here. You can see that the basic structure is all there. You know, I could still go and start to add texture. I could start fussing with details. Um, but you can see that, you know, there's something interesting happening here. You've got this cool trolley that's got a nice sharp focal point in the front. Um, it's starting to get some nice lost edges disappearing in the center. There's an implication of a background. There's so many different ways I could start to, to take this painting now. Um, so I just want, want to ask you guys, what, how would, what would you like me to see me do in the, in the final minutes here? How would you, uh, what would be worth the time for you guys the most? Maybe um, how would you like add uh, certain details into this? So like the rocks mm -hmm. and uh, like the well, inside of the train or any of that? Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like the rocks and pebbles, that's not really stuff I want to draw. I, I don't think I like, you know, if you come in here, okay. that's so much little unnecessary detail. I'm not too concerned with that, honestly. You know, that's sort of why I came in here with the texture brush and just sort of started adding indication. That stuff, that's really, I would say as a painter, stuff that's not really necessary. I mean, if you really like high resolve paintings, then that's something you want to get into. But I'm much more concerned, especially at this stage, with just getting the form right, getting that popping, you know, in the getting the atmosphere right, getting that popping. Um, you know, I think you could maybe start to come in and I'll, I'll maybe show how, how I might indicate. I, I might come in with a, a, a different texture brush here. Let's see what I got. Uh, That's what yeah. I had to kind of struggle with a little bit. Like I don't know, like how much detail I should really put in. Sometimes well, I would like I would overdo it, and then it would take away from the. the main yes. Focus. So like, how much, how much detail would you recommend to to put into drawings like these? Um, you know, I don't really want to tell you. I don't want to give you a hard answer on that because you're going to be your own painter. You're not me, right? You're 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 going to be your own painter, and so. If you want, if you want that level of fidelity in your work, I'm not going to say don't try to go for that. What I will say is just work from big shapes to small. So in terms of my actual shapes here, these are the smallest shapes in the whole image, right? You know, and that's so much busy work. I'm not too concerned with that. I'm much more concerned with getting the perspective on this right, getting the directional lines of the track right, getting the actual values you know, pulling forward here. This. I'm not saying don't do this stuff, but if you are going to do it, this is like the last thing you do in your painting. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure you get all the other stuff right first. I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you never to go to that level of fidelity, but I will say, work from big to small, and that's like the smallest thing there. So, um, just if if you're ever getting hung up on that, just think you know. And I'm I'm going to try to indicate a little bit more texture in here. If you're ever getting hung up on that kind of stuff, just think about big to small, right? work big to small and ask yourself, is this, is this really the, where the painting is going to live and die in, in these little, in the texture of these rocks here? Or do I have maybe some bigger issues like, oh, my value relationships in, in the trolley, right? That's going to make, make the painting live or die much more than, than you know, a, a, getting the, the shapes of a few pebbles on the ground, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Does, does that kind of help? Yes, it does. Okay, good. Actually, I kind of like that in there. <laughs> That's a little too hard for my shadow. Again, I, you want to keep the shadow sort of soft. I'm just sort of starting to play with some texture. Now we can start to, I really like a nice texture brush, you know. Um, I'm just sort of going through and starting to add some nice grit into the image. But again, this is stuff you do later as as you go.
Yeah, always remember, work big big to small. Big to small. Form a hierarchy of what's the most important thing to accomplish in your image. And I bet you anything, it's not those pebbles, right? So work from big shapes to small shapes. And even, even if you find, if you, there's a lot of painters out there who paint really like photorealistic, but every single one of them, they don't start with that photorealistic detail. They, they, don't, they don't start at that level of, of you know, high res. They work up to it over time. It's something you've kind of got to earn. We mentioned earlier that the, the sort of the edge, the rim of those clouds, we want it to pop. I want these to feel. I'm horrific at painting clouds for whatever reason. I don't know why, but uh, I'm always jealous of other painters, the way they're able to, to do clouds. But you have to think of them as three-dimensional objects, just like everything else. I can't get it. see there's there's a lot of volume in the cloud there and try and reassert some of that depth of volume Yeah, see, cause, you know, I fussed with texture there, but that didn't really change the painting a whole lot, did it? You know, it, it, I would say it, it marginally beneficial, you know, but it's I'm not really fussing with the structure of the painting, the actual painting core, of you know? And so it's easy to get fussy with all those little details, but that's not how where the painting's going to live and die, right? And so don't get too carried away with that. You can get to that stuff in the end, but there's sort of a law of diminishing returns as you go along, you know, that smaller stuff, you're not going to get a whole lot of payback for, for spending time on it. Focus on your big things, get your values right. And, uh, you know, that's where your painting's going to live and die. I'm just going to do a little indication of, of, you know, this white line here. Not sure I'm too keen on that, but that's okay. What other questions do you guys have? <clears throat> or anything you'd like me to demonstrate? Any Photoshop tricks? come back in. I've completely lost the, the boon here, so I'm going to come back in and reassert that boon. I want that to be a nice sharp object, so that's why I'm using the select tool. And remember those directional lines I was telling you about at the beginning? Well, I've completely lost them in the process of drawing, so I'm going to try to pull them back in here. Create a new layer. Reassert that sort of one point perspective we got going on. Got a f just occurred to me that I've got a few more slides I want to show to you guys. So if you don't have, uh, you guys don't have another immediate question, I can go on to another slide. Right now I'm using the maximum tool to sort of thin out my directional lines a little bit. Filter, other, maximum. Use squareness there. It's sort of knocking it back a little bit. Back up to my my basic rounds. Try not to get too hung up on texture brushes.
Yeah. So yeah, there's some, there's some nice stuff happening here, and this is where you can start to to play with the dials. You know, you can start to to play with. If I go back to my hue saturation, I can, you know, I can kind of push it this way or that. Kind of happy with where that's living. If I go to my black and white, that's okay. You know, that's that's coming all right. There's a lot of detail I don't have but the structure is generally there. I can do an auto tone, eh, you know. These are all dials you can play with. Maybe I'll just use a little bit of that, so I'll duplicate auto, auto contrast. Just give it like a, you know, 14% fill. A little strong. Do a three. I can always, if I go control L, I can play with the uh, the actual levels, the light levels. I can I can make it a little sharper. And also, if you there's an also uh, curves. Curves is a good tool. You come in, you can really play with your white levels. There, your your different light outputs. Here I'm adjusting how much pure pure black there is. I don't like that. And then this is sort of up to your guys' discretion, but it's starting to feel kind of interesting to me. Maybe I won't go the full way with that. You can drive yourself crazy just playing around with the dials. So just always try to remember what you're trying to accomplish with your painting. So I'll go back to, you know, I'm fairly happy with as a thumbnail. You know, if I were starting a painting and planning one out, if I got to this level as a thumbnail, not as an actual painting, but just as a little thumbnail of what I might want to do, I'd probably be kind of happy. You know, I'd, I think that would be okay. Maybe uh, Let me assert some sky in the back here. Again, I've, I've really just sort of copied what's what's there, and I would highly recommend you guys, you know, and I've, I've just done that for the demo's sake, but really what you should be doing is, is sort of taking what you're seeing and, and, and changing it a little bit, um, kind of like what I was doing with the city in the background. You know, you're not beholden to the image. What else do I want to talk to you guys about? Uh, yeah, so here's one of my favorite, uh, kind of what I was mentioning about indication earlier, not drawing every little detail. This is one of my favorite art, uh, watercolor artists, Joseph Zabukvich. Um, and he's, you look at his work and it seems highly realistic. But going back to kind of the pebbles that we were talking about, you know, you take a, one glance at this beautiful watercolor here of a city and go, wow, there's so much detail. But is there? I'm just going to zoom in on this point here. I mean, is there really a lot of detail? Look at how much is getting lost in the shadows. Remember when we were talking about the Howard Pyle theory and how stuff like texture only lives in the light? Look at how much of these buildings, I mean, there's texture here, but it's just sort of watercolor wash, right? And it sort of implies stone, but look, there was so much detail here that he chose to leave out, right? You get the contrast, the sharp contrast of the roofs, but look at that, it's just, it's just an indication of roofs. It's just a single wash of water with little splotches in it and, and indications of roofs, but when you zoom out, it's a city. It's a city, right? So, going back to the pebbles again, are those really necessary? Are those necessary to the to the structure of the painting, living or dying? I don't personally think so. You know, so if you just look at this image and think of how much he was able to leave out while still communicating an extremely rich, complicated environment, he chose some points to add detail here, right? Where like where there's a guy clearly like maybe on a bike here, and there's some cars having those sharp points of detail is important. And even if you were doing those pebbles, maybe you would choose one point to, to indicate the pebbles really strongly, but you don't do it over the whole thing. Uh, one of you asked earlier about drawing water. Here's a great example of drawing water. There's a basic wash that's a gradation from light to dark, but then on top of that, he's indicated a, a second layer on top of that, just the, the marks of the waves. We can look at how much information is lost down here in the shadows. Just enough, just enough indication to say that there's some sort of door or threshold there. But you zoom out and this looks like an extremely rich detailed painting. So 
your painting really isn't going to live or die in the details. It's going to live or die in the in the structure of it. You know, if I go to black and white here, you can see that it still works. These are actually some of his study sketches you can see as he's planning his painting. Now, the draftsmanship he has is very good, right? His his actual attention to to the shapes and proportions is incredibly is incredibly good. So that's why even as he works fast and loose and and knocks a whole bunch of information out, the general silhouettes of everything are still uh, still strong. So just remember, um, if you're getting a little too hung up on painting the details, you're probably missing something. I'm not saying you can't get there, but as I was saying earlier, start big and work small, right? Uh, Zabukvich could easily probably add more detail in here later, but I don't think he needs to. He started with the big shapes, he got it, and the painting works, you know? So, you know, you may find as you start to work from big to small that you go, oh, you know, I didn't need all those little fussy details that I thought I did. So something to keep in mind. Um, I just want to throw in here uh, some of my, my workflow. You guys were asking last time about, do I scan stuff? Do I take photos? So on the top here, I've, I have an example of, of the actual pirate. Here was the, here was the actual uh, a photo of the watercolor I did in the figure painting class. Here's when I tossed it in the computer and started playing around with it, started adding texture, started adding color, you know, and, and started you know, the, working with the proportions of the face and all that. And you can see it's really rough, rough, you know, um, but it gets there. You can see the progression. It's a bit contrasty here. I brought it all into more of a, a family of color and, and tone there and uh, starts working a lot better, right? Because you can see here, this is really dark up here and uh, it's a bit contrasty. I brought it more into a medium set of tones and shrunk the face down. It starts to work a lot better. Here, this, here was a scan of a watercolor I did, but you can see it picked up and sort of digitized all the, all the, the watercolor paper texture, which is nice. I want texture in the image, but I don't need it everywhere. And so one of the first things I did is I came in and I knocked out all the texture in the sky. I softened all that in the sky and I left it on the rock. And so the rock maintained that texture and uh, it sort of pulls through in the end. You get it nice on all that an original scanned texture you get on the on the actual physical objects, but you don't get it in the sky. Um, and I also just want to mention uh, different additional resources. Marco Bucci's YouTube channel. It's a great one. I highly recommend checking out. Uh, the book I was using earlier by Andrew Loomis was Creative Illustration. Um, uh, I, I own that book. I highly recommend it. All the stuff I was talking about, like the, the form principle, um, it's all in there. It's great stuff. If you're interested in like real, uh, in learning real mediums like watercolor or oil painting, um, there's this, uh, there's lots of sites on that. But uh, this one is, is uh, Color in Your Life. It's this guy in, in Australia. I think it's like local television. <clears throat> Excuse me who goes around um, Australia meeting great artists. Joseph Zabukvich is one of them. And they he does he um, videotapes them doing demos of their paintings. And it's really great. And then uh, Schoolism, that's, that's where I'm taking some online art courses right now. I'm taking a Craig Mullins digital painting course. Um, yeah, so great stuff there as well. So again, you know, really simple painting here with the trolley, but I hope, you know, I hope you can see it's, it's a great example of how to start a painting, not necessarily how to finish one. Um, you know, I'm kind of happy with this as a rough thumbnail. There's a lot, there's so many different directions I could go with it from here to actually bring it into rich detail, but that could take several more hours. And so um, if you guys are happy with this right here, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to leave it here as well, um, unless there's any specific things you'd like to see or questions you want to ask. Are there uh, any other questions for Sam? Uh, if we don't have any questions right now, um, are we able to email you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, S-D-U-S-L-E at gmail.com. S as in Sam, D as in dog, U-S-L-E at gmail.com. Here, I'll type it out right now because I know it's... Uh, I'll make this bigger for you guys. But yeah, feel free, feel free to email me. Ask your questions. Um, you know, again, I'm still learning too. You know, I'm I'm still fairly new to this. I only started painting a couple of years ago. I'm very lucky that I get to do this for a living. I'm a little surprised by it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> 
but uh, you know, I'm, I'm still learning and, and um, you know, so, you know, I, I'm fairly happy with, with how this, this is going. Hopefully did, did you guys get, you're giving me some feedback here. Did you guys get, uh, find this helpful? Did you find the, the demo interesting? Yes, I did. Yes. Did, did you? Yeah. I, um, I think, uh, your breakdown, uh, of your approach, uh, is priceless. Um, uh, okay. it, it gives them, uh, a great starting point, um, to work on anything, uh, you know, uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, <laughs> I was just uh, sitting back, um, just thinking like, wow, you're you're walking them through your like a step by step process of how your mo your mind processes, uh, you know, <laughs> different approaches and different struggles that yeah. that you have as you're creating a, an illustration, and that's that's amazing. Uh, if I was a student growing up. Uh, listening to you talk, I, <laughs> I would just be mind blown. So uh, that was <laughs> well, thank, awesome. Well, that's good. Well, hopefully, you got to see the good and the bad, right? You got to see the stuff right. that I was struggling with, and you got to see the stuff that 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 came a little bit easier, right? And so, hopefully, that's sort of you know, I, I wanted to be sort of candid with you guys um, as I went. You, you saw the stuff that was working, the stuff that didn't. You know, I'm still trying to hone in my process, and um, but that's not something you see a whole lot of. I think even on YouTube, you know, you see the great illustrators, you, you can watch them do walkthroughs and that's helpful. Um, but, you know, I'm still learning. And, and so hopefully you can see as I was going through here, I was trying stuff. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Um, you know, I, I think I'm kind of happy with where it ended up. But, uh, you know, hopefully it's just sort of an honest, candid example of, of uh, you know, one person's process and, and that that's helpful for you guys. Yeah, I think so. Um... The, those techniques that you that you've given them will be cornerstones to them moving forward uh, and building up their own process. So it's a it's a Good. great foundation for them. Good. Just remember your fundamentals. It's all fundamentals, right? All the the fancy textures and the filters and the, all that stuff is dressings. You know, just get your fundamentals right. Get your value structure right. You know, like I was saying, you know, get if you can just get the form principle alone right, you're gonna be fine. You know. Um, getting your values right stuff like edges is nice you can see these are great edge pieces but the values are, are right and that's what makes them work working with good shapes you know and uh indicate don't draw every pebble uh, <laughs> i can't emphasize how, how much that i'm well you can draw the pebbles only after you've driven drawn everything else big to small work big to small uh you know and uh, i think you'll be surprised at how little of the pebbles you have to draw good yeah. All right. Um, are there any other questions, uh, gentlemen? Can I send you something I'm working right now to get feedback on? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. As long as it's not, um, as long as it doesn't, it's not like a Disney specific thing. Like I can't, I can't solicit Disney. Like if it's a roller coaster for a Disney theme park, I can't. You know, I, I can't. I can't do that. But if it's just like a it's personal totally painting you're doing on your own, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's just that's just the one thing I have to specify. If you guys say say hey, like, here's a Disney roller coaster I'm working on, I can't look at it, I can't see it. Um, you'll get me into tons of legal hot water. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, anything else, anything personal, I'm I'm happy to take a look at it and give you my feedback. Um, and feel free to critique oh. my work as well. You know, uh, you know, this is. You know, uh, Feel free to. Well, did you, did you want to post it right now, or did you uh, want to uh, email him later? Oh, yeah, if, if you email if you email me right now, I can I can pull it up. If, if, uh, unless you don't want me pulling it up in front of everybody. <laughs> it's still being work. It needs a bit more work from my end. Okay. 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 Yeah. Fine. If you, yeah. Email <laughs> me personally, and I'm happy to give uh, give you feedback on that. Cool. All right. Well, Sam, uh, thank you for sharing your experience, your talent, uh, and your time. Um, I think uh, these guys got an amazing opportunity to, um, you know, get some insight into how an artist and illustrator uh, works through a project. So thank you for your time. Yeah, it was just a, you know, I try to be candid with you guys. So hopefully that was helpful. Definitely. Cool. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for our second uh, T2 here at Bosco Tech, and um, I'll see you guys around. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Awesome, awesome audience. And yeah, feel free Thank to you. send me your questions. Have a good day. You as well. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you.